Hi, and welcome to our chapter discussion for chapter 10 on managing teams. This chapter deals with a, a topic that most of us can relate to because many people have uh, spent lots of times either at work or in classes uh, working in different types of teams. So what we're going to be doing is looking at things like the benefits versus the risks or disadvantages of teams. And then we'll break, down into, uh, break teams down into the many different functions that they can serve and um, how they can actually be leveraged, the different types of teams that can be used in organizations. So as we go through this discussion, as I usually suggest, try to think of your personal situation, experiences that you've had on the job um, or experiences you had just in your personal life and relate these back to concepts that we discuss. So let's begin by looking at a couple of the advantages and disadvantages of teams. As we look at the advantages, your, your book gives a good list of, of things such as improving customer customer satisfaction um, for an organization um, or enhancing the product service or quality so as we have teams you get better feedback you get more perspectives you get a diversity of thought and some of those benefits should be things like this um, one of the things your book talks about with employee job satisfaction is what it calls cross training and cross training is the idea that a that you have multiple employees on one team in that every employee knows or learns how to do every single task uh, across the team. So if you have five individuals that do five different jobs, well, we create a team and cross-training with me that now each of those five individuals learns how to do the other four people's jobs. And the idea behind this, the reason that it increases job satisfaction is that um, it, it gives people more skills. It also gives them a diverse set uh, of skills and expectations on the job where they're doing different tasks. Um, the last advantage that it talks about is increasing the quality, should increase the quality of decision making. Some of the disadvantages. Um, there's actually a lot of disadvantages and you can probably again think back to your personal experience on teams and you'll notice some of these. Um, one of the disadvantages is initially high turnover. Uh, we actually see early in the early stages of team development a high level of turnover um, and this this is actually probably positive turnover uh, or functional turnover uh, but it is definitely uh, one of the side effects. Second is the idea of social loafing. Um, while I'm sure no, nobody out there has ever been this person in a group, everybody has had that one team member um, that didn't do anything. Um, a team setting creates a dynamic to where it often allows for people to loaf, for a social loafer to be present, be on the team, take credit for what the team did, but actually put in little to no um, contribution. The next thought that we have here is the idea of groupthink. Groupthink is, is a fundamental error or disadvantage of teams because it, it often causes groups to fall susceptible to a lack of creativity, a lack of diverse thought. Um, the idea here is that because maybe you have um, somebody throws out an idea and then that naturally starts to conform everybody else's thoughts. So, uh, for example, um, let's say that I told you we have a million dollars to start a new business. And we as a class decided we were going to try to come up with an idea. Well, if the, the idea of groupthink would say, all right, if the first person throws out a suggestion of, well, let's start a, let's start a barbecue restaurant, well, then naturally now everybody else is going to be biased by that initial uh, position. And so maybe uh, people are more likely to start jumping into the restaurant category if, even if they don't necessarily think – we're going to do barbecue, maybe the next suggestion is, well, maybe we should do a so-and-so restaurant or this type of food. Rather than backing up and actually thinking of a whole, uh, the millions upon millions of different ideas that we could actually do. The last concept uh, or disadvantage that, that your book discusses for teams is the idea of minority domination. Minority domination is usually a function of the personality traits of individual team members. So, for example... Um, we may have a team to where there's one or two very, very strong personalities um, and individuals on that team. And so if it's a group of five or six people, we actually have one or two people that because they are so either forceful or so um, overzealous or 
find or they get put on teams that with people that are maybe quieter or don't want to create conflict, all of a sudden the team decision making gets dominated by a small group within that team. As your book discusses, the idea of autonomy is a key ingredient uh, whenever we're looking at teams. The autonomy that is possessed within a team dictates the type of team that, that is, is being used. So autonomy, just for definition, as your book describes it, is the degree to which workers have the discretion, freedom, and independence to decide how and when to accomplish their jobs. So the autonomy scale uh, can range. Uh, if you look at Exhibit 10.2 from your book, you know we see from the most basic or lowest levels of autonomy, we see a situation where a team is just given a task. So they are told, here's the task that you're going to do. We've already made all the decisions about it. Now you just need to go and execute this task. Whereas if we go to the very opposite end, it's called self-designing teams. And in this case, uh, we're looking at teams to where they're naturally developed, they're developed by individuals themselves who go through the whole decision-making process by themselves, who decide, uh, gather all the information, and then choose how they're going to execute this task and what the goals for that task are. And so this would be extremely high team autonomy. And of course, we have multiple different levels between here, such as with employee involvement groups, semi-autonomous autonomous work groups, and also self-managing teams. Your book also goes into a discussion of some, some different kinds of special teams, such as cross-functional teams, virtual teams, and project teams. So let's briefly discuss these. A cross-functional team is when you have a team that consists of individuals that are cross-functional. They are from different areas of the firm. So this team, team members, are composed from different employees from, from differing areas of the organization. And there's, there can be extreme benefit to this. Um, so, for example, let's say that we were going to launch a new product. And uh, if we were going to decide what product are we going to launch, how are we going to market it, um, what, what technology are we going to put into it, well, those decisions are dependent on lots of different things within an organization. So we can't just make a decision or create a product and launch it in a bubble. The decisions that impact that launch would be dependent on things like somebody from finance, somebody from the marketing area, somebody from the operations or logistics area, maybe somebody from our engineering department, from the R&D. You know, we, and so if we created a team uh, rep with a representative from each of those different areas, then it should uh, reduce the red tape. It should help us to be more efficient in launching that, part, that new product. A virtual team uh, is when we have people that are from geographically different areas. Um, this has become very common, commonly used in organizations. We have many different uh, jobs now that can be done completely uh, from a complete remote setting. And in this case, we would have maybe multiple members in different locations that would dial in, to, you know, find somewhere, log on to the internet, or um, <clears throat> meet each other virtually uh, for for those team meetings. The third that it talks about is your project teams. Um, and a project team is, is simply a team that's created to, uh, to complete one specific task. Um, they're given a goal, they're given one specific task. Once they accomplish it uh, over a certain period, a lot of amount of time, then the team disperses. Um, so uh, this could be maybe a project team that's, that's responsible for um, hiring a new employee. You bring together employee, you bring, bring together people, you say, here's the task, we're going to do this. Figure it out, let's hire them, and then once that once the person's hired, then the team would disperse. So tied into all these teams are lots of different things that your book discusses that are that are referred to as work team characteristics. Make sure you spend some time reading this area um, in your textbook. Uh, we'll briefly discuss some of these concepts, but these are these are integral ideas, and you should be able to relate to to most of these. So, some of the, some of the main concepts that your book discusses are things like team norms. I mean, team norms are simply the agreed upon standards, the basics that everybody is responsible to work by. Um, so, there should be an understanding between on certain things about the behavior on a team, and usually this can this can be either formally or informally developed. So you might have been on a team in the past to where you were asked to sign a contract and everybody agreed about maybe meeting times or about 
um, individual contributions or something like that. This would be formally establishing team norms. The second idea uh, discussed is, is team cohesiveness. And cohesiveness is basically the extent to which members are attracted to this team and want to or are motivated to stay a part of it. So it's the connection among the individuals. Um, and if you have a strong connection, then that should be between personalities or between um, maybe backgrounds or whatever it might be, then it should create a higher level of cohesiveness. And there's a strong amount of literature supporting the notion that high levels of cohesive, cohesiveness result in very high levels or high performing teams. The third that we'll look at is team size. Now there's, this has been a, a rather debatable topic in, in literature and even in your textbook it kind of leaves this a little bit open. The, the perfect size of a team is very dependent on the task at hand. Um, some, some people would suggest teams between you know, the numbers of three to five or six. Um, other things where it's a larger company, you may want to somewhere between uh, five to 10 to 20 even. Um, for one thing your book says is it talks about a, a perfect size being somewhere between six and nine members. So just remember team size is a relative concept and it does depend on the task that's trying to be pursued. Team conflict um, is, is a very interesting topic because most people hear the idea of conflict and they try to avoid it at, at, all, at all costs. Um, this, is, this should not be done within teams. There's two different types of conflict that we've talked about in the past. And this, this is basically healthy con conflict or unhealthy conflict. It is uh, affective conflict or A-type conflict, uh, conflict, which is the emotional relationships that maybe cause problems in, within the team. Or there's C-type conflict or cognitive conflict, uh, which is differences or it, conflict related to problems or issues that are a task. The C-type conflict is something that's very positive. It can bring value to a team because if you, if you enhance C-type conflict, then you'll create a higher level of dialogue and a higher level of discussion among team members, ultimately re resulting in uh, or should result in a uh, stronger performance of the team or a more optimal decision-making model. The last part of this, uh, of this slide with work team characteristics is related to the different stages of a team. And you've probably heard these before, um, the concepts of forming, storming, norming, performing, and then adjourning. Or in, as you're presenting in your textbook, adjourning is the last three, which is denorming, de-storming, and deforming. So it's this development of a team that you go through battles or you go through uh, this creation process. Um, and then once you get to the performing stage, you, which should be the longest stage, uh, you perform, and then after that's completed, you are go back through this settling down or this ending stage of team development. The next section of your book talks about setting team goals or priorities. The importance of setting goals within teams cannot be understated. Uh, what we see often with a team or in organizations or, again, thinking about your own personal teams within a class, uh, we often see a group of individuals coming together and then there's an assumption there that because we come together and we have the knowledge of four or five people um, that, we should, that we will collectively achieve more. Um, the whole purpose of a team is this, is, follows this concept. Um, the problem is uh, many times teams actually perform less or below what they would perform individually because of poor functioning. And a lot of this poor functioning can be related back to a lack of setting goals or setting team structure uh, for how to achieve something. Um, so setting something specific that you're going to try to achieve or being specific uh, about the goals that are there um, can actually completely change the likelihood of success or failure for a team. As, this, as the slide states, increasing a team's performance is inherently more complex than just increasing one, one person's performance. So we have to set different types of goals. Your book suggests and talks through things, the, the SMART goals, that are goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Um, it goes into a second section talking about stretch goals, and this has become kind of a more common thing, um, especially in 
um, in, in medium to higher levels of organizations to where you set a goal that is rather unrealistic or sometimes extremely unrealistic and you don't really give an agenda for how to achieve it. And the idea is that you're pushing employees or pushing these teams um, beyond what their perceived limits are. And by doing that, you let them force them to become creative or to kind of push their boundaries and their innovation um, to tr try to achieve this very high uh, or a very ambitious goal. The next section in your textbook that we'll look at is as selecting members for teams. And there's lots of different research related to how we select people for different types of teamwork. Um, before we go into these, you know, there's a few main ideas. And, and the most important to remember is that we have to remember the reason for developing the team. And we have to uh, make sure that we consider uh, what the goals are for this team to accomplish. And as we consider those different op or those different um, points within this, it can, it can massively manipulate the types of individuals that we're wanting to bring onto a team. So whenever we talk about these concepts, don't necessarily consider all of them good or bad. Think of them relative to what the goal of the team is. So one of the things that's talked about uh, is this idea of individualism versus collectivism. Um, individualists uh, put their own interests first, their own welfare, whereas collectivists would put the group ahead of itself. And so we have to consider what type of personality are we bringing in? Are they goal-driven for the team? Or are they goal-driven for the individual? And again, this shouldn't be necessarily considered uh, a good or a bad trait. This can, it should be more looked at as what type of person do we need to make this team function? Second uh, is this idea of team level, and team level covers a variety of different, uh, of different concepts. Um, so this is looking at the average level of things like past experience, personal ability, um, different personality factors, um, lots of situational factors, how people will respond to something, um, but it's looking at this, again, this average ability. There's a term that's used often called human capital. Um, human capital is, we, is, relates to the qualities or the value within a human, the capital that they bring to some setting. So uh, human capital can be measured by things like past work experience or number of years of experience within a specific industry or uh, past product innovation experience or something like that. And so if we look at that as a team level attribute, then, attribute, then we might look at the average level of X across all the individuals on the team to give us a good picture of uh, what the of what we are what qualities we have within this team. The fourth concept here is team diversity. Um, diversity here is referring to a variety of different things. It says here variances or differences in ability, personality, or any other factor on a team. So maybe it's diversity in thought. Maybe it's diversity in past experience. Maybe maybe it's diversity in expertise that we're wanting. Um, there's actually quite a bit of of, or, of organizational research looking at diversity, and one of the leading authors in this area, her name is Myrtle Bell, um, she's looked at, uh, well, she's broken diversity down into surface level, um, surface level and deep level diversity. And what she refers to with surface level is things like, um, uh, things that are visual. So it could be race, it could be gender, it could be oftentimes religion or something uh, like that. But people that are, that's more on the surface level side versus deep level where it's differences that are internal. It's a deep level diversity to be a, uh, differences in thought, perspective, maybe background. Um, and, and these two different types of diversity can, can actually drive different types of performance. Um, a more interesting line of research recently has been looking at what is the true value of diversity in teams. I'm sure you've heard or we've been told lots and lots of times that, you know, the more diverse a team that we have, the better. And um, well, there's been quite a bit of recent literature um, of uh, looking at different types of teams and diversity within teams that argues partially against that. Um, and so it's not just diversity for diversity's sake. And we're, again, we're using a very broad level uh, term of diversity here, but it should be calculated diversity. We want to create the types of diversity that are going to help us um, become stronger in our ability to, to perform as a team. The last section of this chapter that we'll talk about um, is, is compensation. 
So there's lots of different approaches to compensation, but your book decide, uh, harnesses just a few of these and pays a little bit of attention here. One of these is what it calls skill-based pay. And skill-based pay is simply compensation uh, that pays employees for learning additional skills or knowledge. So as they gain knowledge or because they do X uh, or can, can now accomplish something, then they will be paid for obtaining that skill. The second, uh, second concept put here is gain sharing, and this is very common. Um, this is a system to where uh, the company shares the financial performance or the financial gains uh, with the workers. So the, if the, you bring together these teams, they perform, and if they, as a result of their performance, the company benefits greatly financially, um, then part of that revenue or all of that revenue would then be turned around and split up among the employees uh, that are performing for that team. Again, you can, you can imagine this would be probably a very highly motivational approach within an organization. And then finally is just non-financial rewards. You know, things like giving vacations or extra days off. Um, it's, you know, surprisingly, even handing out things like an award or a certificate have very strong influences on job satisfaction, um, on, on lowering the likelihood of turnover. So these, those last couple of things, awards and certificates or even t-shirts, these are things that are maybe are minimal, minimal or very low cost to a firm and yet can have an extreme impact on the, on the happiness of an employee or even the, the uh, culture, the positive culture within an organization. Okay, that concludes chapter 10 for us uh, here looking at managing teams. Uh, as always, please make sure that you've read through this chapter carefully and then uh, please go ahead and complete the rest of the assignments for this week. I look forward to talking to you next week.